um, on time. So our next speaker is Michael McDonald. He is a professor in the Department of Community and Behavioral Health in the um, in the Elson S. Floyd College of Medicine at Washington State University, of which he is a found, founding faculty member. He's the Director of Promoting Research Initiatives in Substance Use and Mental Health Collaborative, and oh, that collaborative known as PRISM, the PRISM Collaborative, and the co-director of the Rural Center for Opioid Prevention, Treatment, and Recovery. Dr. McDonald is a clinical psychologist. His research focuses on using strategies such as contingency management to improve care for people who experience addiction-related disparities, such as individuals with co-occurring disorders and American Indian and Alaska Native people. He's involved in multiple state-level projects focused on supporting the implementation of contingency management into practice. So Michael's passionate about partnering with communities to conduct research that improves the lives of community members, as well as mentoring graduate students, staff, and faculty who identify as members of groups um, underrepresented in science. So Michael, please take the floor. All right, thank you, Steve. I am excited to be here. Um, thank you for that nice introduction because I can just skip talking about myself. That's great. So I have some disclosures, I think. I never understand disclosures. And since drug companies really and pharmaceuticals don't fund me, I, I just try to list them anyway. So, so we're being paid right now to do training by the states of Montana, Washington. We just are about to start in Wisconsin. And then we work with um, Beth and Tom and uh, the team at UCLA on work in California. And then we also work with a tribal partner in Arizona. And as Steve was mentioning, we just got our notice of grant award from SAMHSA saying that we are now funded to do a Region 10 Northwest Rural Opioid Center, which now SAMHSA has changed the rules on the opioid center funding. We can now support uh, folks with stimulant use disorder. So a major focus of that is going to be um, is going to be contingency management. And I will ma I made a little SAMHSA joke there for those of you get Gipras. Um, so, you know, we are out in the woods in Washington state, um, the, the, the evergreens, not the deciduous woods. And, uh, but, and we have a team of a large team of contingency management researchers. So, uh, former postdoc, um, John Roll, a postdoc of Steve's is, is our leader. Um, and, uh, we also have, uh, Sterling McPherson, who some of you probably know, does a lot of work on pharmaceuticals and combining, um, medications and contingency management for alcohol use disorder. You all heard from Dr. Hershack yesterday about her, um, our, her outstanding work in native communities. We have another colleague, Andre Miguel, who does, has been doing contingency management for a long time, probably 12 years, uh, research in Brazil and is also interested in non-abstinent targets. Those are, that's our research sort of contingency management team. Today I'm going to talk, I'm mostly going to use slides um, from Dr. Sarah Parent, um, who is our lead contingency management trainer, and also we've hired a new person uh, to help to help us implement trainings on contingency management because we're really a research team that had to, that was asked to pivot to do training. Um, and then we have 15 staff and that are involved in this work, and as Steve was mentioning, my work really is mostly on alcohol use disorder contingency management um, and alcohol biomarkers. So I want to just give a quick shout out to our all of how we, I'm going to sort of move into how, to, how do we get into this work, because we're going to need a lot of you all who are doing research and contingency management to join us. So the first one is that my agent is sitting right there, Rick Rawson. Um, anytime something's, anybody's interested in contingency management outside of California, he's, uh, he's, he's telling them to email me, and I think some of them do. Uh, and then Tom and Beth, who are out there doing great work in California, we really appreciate your collaboration. And uh, and then our, a new partnership we have with Sarah Becker and her team at Northwestern. Um, maybe I don't know if Sarah mentioned it because I had to step out. Sarah, I'm sorry, I had a meeting for your talk. But we uh, implementation scientists. There's so few of them in this space. Sarah and her team being the leaders, and we actually got together and how uh, this is our second out of three symposiums we're doing on contingency management implementation. Um, so the field of implementation science is excited about this. They're excited about it. In fact, um, thanks to Sarah and uh, Kate and Dr. Clark, we won for, uh, presentation, the best research presentation award at the Society for Implementation Research uh, Conference. 
And then a big thank you to I mean, hearing CC speak this morning was really inspiring and, and just the work that that Dr. Clark and, and Dr. Rawson and, and, and Steve have done um, on advocating to actually make this a possibility. Um, I just genuinely really appreciate that work and I know our team does. And then we have a list of our partners here that we work with. So I appreciate that so much, the work that you all have done to advocate for this to even be possible because like a lot of you who've done contingency management research for a while, and I've only done contingency management research for 14 years, but I sat in my office before the pandemic when I used to sit in my office and I thought, what the hell am I doing? Like, why do I keep applying for grants to study an intervention as a clinical psychologist that no one's using outside of the great work in the VA? And so this is a, this is a um, story that uh, many of, I think the folks in this room and, uh, and somebody actually, I think talked about yesterday, uh, when the New York Times that was sort of reporters are totally confused by this. Like, why, why really don't, why wouldn't you do this? Uh, what's, what's the issue that, and so I thought to myself, what the hell am I doing? So that was, that was in 2019. So in 2020, our research got shut down, right? Our in-person research got shut down and we needed something for our team to do, right? They couldn't just sit there twiddling their thumbs because that's not good for research coordinators. They don't like doing that. So, so we said, well, what do we do? Let's, let's do some training stuff. Let's, let's create some training materials. And so we started scouring the internet. We found you know, the blending initiative stuff. We found Nancy's uh, a book. We found some of the other, other training materials that were out there. And just like our training materials, a lot of them were very research heavy, very dense, very long. Um, and, and we felt like we could improve them. Then there's of course, ATTC materials that were out there, some really great videos. Um, but we also didn't feel like those gave you enough information to be able to go do contingency management the next week, like to be able to walk into the clinic and actually implement a program. So we worked on improving those materials at least, uh, but we did this sort of as an experiment because we had, had a clinic across the street say, hey, we got a little grant. Would you guys train us to do contingency management in our buprenorphine residency clinic? And we said, sure. So we thought it was a one off. And then Rick started emailing me. Um, and saying, mostly because of our work in Native communities that Rick knew about, and saying, hey, this, that's something unique you all have expertise in. Could you help us out? And, and we said, sure. So we started, you know, refining these materials. And then, you know, this whole, the changes that Wesley talked about in the, Dr. Clark talked about in the OIG rules happened. Rick, that's why Rick started getting all these inquiries. And then in 2020, uh, 21, we got real when Montana actually said, hey, we'll pay you guys to do this. Um, and we want to do it with 14 clinics. So we started doing that work then. And then what I think is really important is sort of how things happen. And I know there's folks who study this in terms of policymaking, but that provider, that one physician who reached out to us in Spokane and said, hey, will you come across and we, our neighbor come across and train us in contingency management? She ended up emailing the Department of Health or the Healthcare Authority, which is our Medicaid wing of, of the government and the substance abuse folks there and saying, hey, why aren't you doing contingency management in Washington? So this one physician emailed to send an email to them. They said, hey, we'd like to well, tell us more. And she said, hey, Mike, will you come with me to this meeting? And I did. And we walked out two, two weeks later, they ended up funding us to do a 24 site implementation. So that individual sort of provider level advocacy, I think is really important in the space. So as we've done this training work, and again, we're a phase three clinical trials team, like we do community based clinical trials. And so we understand sort of the issues around implementation, but we are not implementation scientists, and we have historically not been trainers. And so what we knew is we knew how to do contingency management. A lot of us are clinicians, so we understood the healthcare space, like we understand what a CPT code is, and we understand the workflow inside of a clinic and things like that. We obviously had this expertise that we've developed in partnership with native communities to do our tribally adapted model that Kate talked about. And we're a university, so we can kind of do grants and contracts, right? Um, but what, and, and so what we've learned so far, because I like to read the end of it, like, I don't know about the rest of you, but I like to open up a novel and read the last page first. Um, so I'm giving you a little bit of the conclusions here. So what we learned is that we needed simple, very clear, one model version of contingency management training. And a little unsurprisingly, I, I, I really was convinced that we could do a half day workshop on contingency management and we could walk away and that'd be fine. But as Sarah knows and others know, um, you that's not gonna work. So we've learned that ongoing support is so important. And we had to learn new kinds of languages. We had to learn the policymaker language 
We had to learn what a Medicaid waiver was. I, mean, I heard of them, but I didn't know what they were. Um, we had to learn what dissemination implementation language is and, and sort of understand that. And then, and then we also, what we've learned is that there's so much enthusiasm for this. Those moral objections that we've talked about and this stigma certainly is out there in providers at a provider to provider level. And it's certainly out there politically, et cetera. But man, it's been amazing to see how excited people are about this as opposed to like 14 years ago when I started doing this work, people were like, it's all those, those, those objections that we talked about, which again are totally there. I agree hundred uh, percent. They were almost there all the time. And so I think, um, you know, I just, we see that there's so much enthusiasm. In fact, it worries me sometimes. Sometimes I have to talk people back down from a sort of an enthusiasm cliff because I have policymakers saying, oh my God, this is going to end homelessness. This is so great. This is going to, this is going to, this is going to totally um, cure our problems with crime. I'm like, well, I don't know about that. So we've had to sort of talk people down. We also learned we need all kinds of help. Uh, the things we still are trying to figure out, and it's so great. Every time Dr. Clark gives a talk, I just learned so much more about um, about about the OIG and the rules. Um, we've learned about Medicaid waivers, and they still don't make sense to me. And then we we know we need a training workforce. We have to figure that out because not only do we have a workforce barrier in terms of turnover and, and people leaving the field, the doing the clinical services, but we also have a workforce challenge with our our folks to do the training. So going back to sort of where, where we're at in terms of our training model that we offer right now. So this is, these are components of trainings that we offer states or our large healthcare systems now. Um, and it's some of this, you'll hear from Tom later about sort of how, how they um, sort of scaffold on to top of this and to, to support the California project. So first we have an overview training, which is just sort of probably like the, the, um, the, the video that, that the team here has, 45-minute um, video, you know, just gives an overview of what's contingency management, what's it about, Where's, what's the theory behind it, what do you, what do you, um, what, 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 what's the evidence for it, what are some issues around the OIG stuff to think about. But it really is intended for anyone who like might refer a person to the program, might be a policymaker that's interested in the program, might be a person with lived experience that's interested in the program. So it's just really designed for anybody. And then we have a nuts and bolts, we call it. And, and that is literally exactly how you do the model, which is, I would say voucher, but it's really gift card model of contingency management that we have specifically designed, not designed because we're, we're repurposing stuff that's out in the literature, that's specific to stimulant use disorder only. So it has what you're in cup to buy. It has, you know, how frequently you do the tests or how, how, how they have to be separated by a day or two. It has all the actual practical information you'd have, including things like I mentioned down below here. So it has a, a treatment manual that we provide that's about 20 pages, I think, or so. Policy and procedure templates. We've learned, oh my gosh, do, do administrators and clinicians with policy and procedure main procedures um, documents. And then it includes an incentive tracker, which right now we have an implementation that's in REDCap. Um, where you type in the, the result of the urine test, and then it calculates automatically for the clinician exactly how much of an incentive that person gets at that session. So that whole escalation, reset, and recovery piece of contingency management that makes it complicated is simplified. And again, Tom will talk later about some of the stuff probably they're doing in California that's going to you know, take that to the next level. Uh, and that uh, we also then have compliance mon monitoring, and, um, and we learned to meet with with, with not only with the clinicians that do these coaching sessions or the facilitation, and that has to be a lot more frequent and for a lot longer than we thought it needed to be. Um, so it was nice to hear about um, Jim's talk about the VA and their experience. And, and But we also have to meet with the person who's paying, paying for the training because we have to coordinate with states on things like how many urine tests is a person, a Medicaid and really allowed to do in a year. So our model has 24 urine tests. In Washington, you're only allowed to bill for 24 urine tests in a year. So if a person's in contingency management, they can't have any more urine testing the rest of the year. So those kind of practical things, I think, are really important to, to figure out with the um, policy folks that, or, or whoever runs the healthcare organization or the state. So that's our training as it is stands now. Um, so it's got a didactic, didactic component, some technological tools and sort of other tools. And then it also has this ongoing coaching and support infrastructure uh, behind it. So who have we trained? So we've been doing training in Montana for, we're getting close to 18 months now, and we've been doing it in close collaboration with Rick um, and his colleague, Al Hassan, who's her training folks in their Cognitive Behavioral Therapy Trust. And so um, who, we trained 91 people in contingency management at 11 different sites in Montana. 
You can see all this work is mostly funded by SOAR, by the state opioid response grants. So most of the folks that we're training are buprenorphine providers um, and in some context. So either in a hospital context, in a community health clinic, or like a FQHC kind of a context. We have a couple, a tribal center, a mental health center. And although Montana is a very rural place like Vermont, similar to Burlington, there's a lot of micro cities or smaller cities where people live. And so for the most part, um, people tend to live in, the sites we're training are in small towns or in, um, or in urban places. In contrast, in Washington, we've trained 75 clinicians across 24 different sites. Now, Washington does a lot of really cool stuff when it comes to opioids. So we trained a fire department. What the heck are we doing training a fire department? So they're doing low barrier buprenorphine at a fire department. Um, and people were so, this is where I talk about enthusiasm. Washington was so enthusiastic about doing contingency management. They said, hey, train all of our state opioid response sites. Train all of our hub and spokes. Train all of our other, other sites that are doing uh, state opioid response work. Train all of them. And so we jumped in and we trained them all. And we realized, wow, maybe contingency management is not the best thing to do at a jail. Um, maybe that's not the place to start. Maybe a fire department's not the best place to start. Actually, the fire department told us that. Um, so here it's, we had a very diverse group, again, mostly of people who are treating, using medications to treat opioids, um, who are then want to help treat psychostimulant co-use. And this tends to be a very urban, uh, our sites are very urban in Washington. So the care, so in terms of our implementation success thus far, we have in Montana, uh, we have 72 or 73% of all the sites have, have seen at least one patient um, for contingency management. And in Washington, it's only been about 25%. And we've worked in Washington about six months less. Uh, you could see that most of the community health centers, they're the best at getting the model out there in terms of relative to substance use treatment, like right? a standard outpatient substance use treatment facility. Um, hospitals, I'll come back to the discussion about the urine testing. You know, a lot of hospitals don't want to do point of care urine tests. They flat out refuse to do them. Uh, the other thing is gift cards. We find that hospital-based programs, they're, they have a policy. We don't give out gift cards to, to patients. And so they've had, we've had to work through that as well as legal review. So any larger healthcare system we're working with, they're really asking for their own independent legal review. All right. And you can see we're much more successful at um, implementing in or suburban and urban places. So that's a sense of, of the clinics and, and their characteristics. Oh, sorry. Their characteristics. Who are the clients, though? So we had more sites implementing in Montana, but more people have been enrolled in Washington if we did a comparison. Um, so we have more sites in Washington that we trained initially, and, um, and, and, and we had some really high-achieving sites in Washington, and they enrolled a lot of folks. Again, you can see most of the folks, because we're implementing in urban and small towns, they're mostly patients in urban and small towns. So um, that's, an, that's so far um, the characteristics of the number of patients we have in those different um, areas. So, so contingency management, I think just to end in the last few slides, contingency management is so unique because it involves this exchange of some tangible thing, item. It's not counseling, it's not medication management. And, and I think, our best friend has been buprenorphine in our work and our biggest enemy has been buprenorphine. So people are so much more willing to do novel things because of the great work that we've all done with buprenorphine, but they're also expecting contingency management to be as effective as buprenorphine, to be a smoking gun, to be something you could hand out and then have maybe a care manager follow up with that person and they get better. Whereas contingency management, while we all know it's really powerful, it really works and it works better than anything else for stimulants, it's still not perfect, right? And so I think that's also been a struggle for especially primary care practices to have people come in two times a week and then not see it work with everybody. Um, and then of course the, the waiver has been a barrier. So Montana has gotten around that waiver. They're now gonna fund, or they've been funding the extra above the $75 from SOAR. They're using an alcohol liquor tax to fund it. And in Washington, we had uh, legislation passed decriminalizing possession of drugs. And as part of that, contingency management incentives are, are being funded. Uh, and, then, and then I think, you know, what the barriers we've been facing, we, I talked about before, which were really educated. We talk, all talked about it today. It's educating policymakers. How is contingency management different than other interventions? Why might we not want to start with certain um, implementation uh, clinics or certain places to implement? My white, my white, my what? Why might we want to start at other places um, that would be more likely to implement? So being more thoughtful about that. When we think about what's the, 
barrier, when we have experienced barriers at a site level, they tend to be existing sort of philosophies and like, on the other side of stigma is the harm reduction sort of perspective where they, people don't feel comfortable telling patients what they should change or having a pre-existing a pre-existing treatment target like abstinence. So we've gotten some pushback on that and sort of had to walk through that again with education and discussions. Turnover, like I talked about, age, I talked about some of these things around uh, gift card policies and things like that. And then as I'm sure Rick could add to our discussion of this, um, if we have one is, you know, stimulant, people are using stimulants. They're not just breaking down the doors to get this. Um, they're not breaking down the doors to get treatment in general in terms of stimulant use. So we've had to really work just like on our studies on recruitment. So in Montana, we've worked really hard to try to figure out um, how to better recruit patients to get them into the program. So the keys to effective implementation we found so far, the one model idea to teach one simple model, the frequent meeting with the funders, uh, these frequent coaching calls that focus on these three different issues, uh, having this on-demand training, I think we've really realized we cannot keep doing webinars over and over and over again, or live trainings over and over again. They have to be recorded and on-demand to deal with that turnover issue and to deal with the lack of training workforce that we have. And I think you know we've a big discussion we've had, and you know the um, Dr. Clark's talk this morning, you know, is really how do we balance this whole issue of fidelity and the importance of fidelity, especially on some of those OIG rules with clinician flexibility. So we're, I think Tom's going to talk about these kind of ideas um, in his talk, you know, really these ideas of readiness assessments and really understanding better who's ready to do this, not who's enthusiastic, but who's ready. And then also uh, strategies to enhance buy-in, and then we have to have these technology solutions to support us. And all right, so wait, I think I, oh no, I didn't skip over. I'm, my timing's good. So my question is, are we ready for this? Are you ready? For, for national implementation, if SAMHSA lists that, because of all the great work you all are doing. Are we ready for, no, we're just not ready. I mean, we're not ready. So um, so what do we, what's the solution? We need everybody to help. So we need everybody to help on this. We need implementation scientists with expertise so that I don't keep doing the same thing over and over again, wrong. <laughs> we need your help. We need, um, we need, you know, you all who have this amazing expertise in contingency management, especially those of you who are just starting your careers that are like, for the, unlike the rest of us, where you could actually be doing work to help get this out into the real world and policymakers. And we also are going to need those technology solutions like Jesse talked about and, and app companies, because there's going to be such, there's such a demand for this right now. And there's likely to be even more demand that we have to figure out how, how we can use technology to, to do that. So I will leave it at that. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Mike. Um, so we now are uh, going to go to Tom Fries and Rick Rawson, who are going to do a sort of tag team um, match. They are representing, they're uh, leading the California implementation effort with uh, Mike and Sarah and others um, assisting. And so they, they've they coordinated th their presentation. So. Um, Tom is an adjunct professor in the Department of Psychiatry and director of UCLA's Integrated Substance Abuse Programs, where he previously served as a director of training for 20 years. And I was sitting there thinking, you know, I've never trained anybody other than the staff of my grants how to do uh, CM. So this whole body of work has evolved and we have people who know how to do training and know how to do implementation. And like Mike was saying, it's going to take everybody to make this successful. Um, so Tom, Tom has been doing it and he knows how to do it well. Um, he is he got his uh, PhD in clinical psychology from the California School of Professional Psych in 1995, has been a featured presenter at conferences and meetings, and has developed and conducted trainings across the U.S. and internationally. So, Tom? Good 
Thanks, Steve. Uh, I'm really happy to be here today, um, especially since all five of the last presenters have promised I'm going to say something to you. Um, so it makes me a little bit nervous, but in a nutshell, we tried to learn from Jim McRae, uh, do training like Mike said, do implementation like Sarah said, and avoid everything Wes said. That's it. Um, Actually, there are a few more details. Um, <laughs> because what Rick said is most important as we think about how do we implement this thing that you all have done under really great controlled conditions out in the wild? Um, and how do you do a pilot that involves hundreds of people across the state uh, as large as California and make it successful and conform to the protocols that we've all learned throughout the last two days are so critical. So, um, let's see if I can get my slides to move. Eh, no, I'm screwing everything up, hold on. Oh yeah, I went all kinds of places. Can you help me get back to the beginning? Um, so California has long been the seat of stimulant use uh, in the country. It started out west, you know, we kind of went up and down the, thank you very much. Um, it started out west and went up and down the western United States. And then you remember it rolled all the way across the country, made it most all the way up here to New England, but not quite filling out as much as we thought it was going to do. And then it rolled back to the Midwest and settled down for a while. Now it's rolling back again, but it has never left California. Uh, it's been an ongoing issue and finding a appropriate treatments for this condition uh, has been a really critical focus. So California had some really innovative thinkers um, in the last several years who thought, we need to find what works and we need to do what works. And so when they were doing the net, that round of our 1115 waiver, they said, well, CM works. No one's been able to do it this way, but let's do it this way. And so California became the first to write um, contingency management into the 1115 waiver. And surprise to everyone, CMS said yes. Um, and so <laughs> then came the procedure of how the heck do we do this? Um, and so we've spent about the last 10 months doing nothing but planning and developing the systems within which we're going to implement this particular protocol. And one of the critical elements of that planning process was to bring together the key stakeholders. California as a system is very um, is driven by the counties. The state doesn't make a lot of decisions for what's happening in the treatment system. So that stakeholder group involved key county leaders, both small, medium, and large counties, but also direct service providers who um, work in all of those settings so that every decision that we made along the way was vetted through those people. We didn't ask for their approval, and we didn't, they weren't decision makers, but at least they could express their concerns and talk about what they thought would work. And then we could work as a group of implementers to figure out how we could make that work as much as possible within the confines of our protocol. This is it, as far as I'm concerned. Um, the CM coordinator, I think, is one of the most critical roles that we have. Um, when, <laughs> When I look at the training that's out there and we were putting together our training, um, wow, I live in the Wild West and the training in CM is totally the Wild West. You can say you're doing CM training and present absolutely everything because nobody knows exactly what it is. Um, so we compiled all of the CM training that we could from across the nation and figured out that when people are training people, they're saying, you counselor, you counselor, in fact, everybody, Y'all implement CM. What we got was everything, right? So there's really no way to know exactly what's being done. So in trying to follow a protocol in this way in organizations that are not used to research-driven protocols, uh, we looked at kind of best practices and really at Rick's idea, said we need this person called a, a CM coordinator. The CM coordinator is going to be the implementer of each site for contingency management. The rest of the staff will provide good behavioral care, they'll do the administrative work, they'll do all of those other things, but the CM coordinator is the implementer. There will also be a supervisor who will be the cheerleader on site for contingency management, but also able to serve as a backup when our CM coordinator turns over, and a CM backup coordinator. Again, trying to fill those roles along the way. Those are the three minimal staff that are required in order to participate in the protocol. We'll talk about how that works in just a few minutes. 
But first, so let's take a step back and just look at what California has decided to do. Now, our role, our role at UCLA, Beth Rakowski, who's sitting back there, who's now the director of training, uh, and I are leading this project, and we're asked by the state of California to do the training and implementation for this particular project. The project being a 24-week protocol, not a 12-week protocol. Um, the first 12 weeks being kind of standard CM implementation, uh, twice weekly testing with the opportunity for incentives with uh, escalation, reset, and recovery. The second 12 weeks, really maintenance slash retention, a, a flatter schedule um, of uh, reinforcers designed to keep people coming back in so that we can continue to provide them the support that they need along the way. As has been said in much of the research trials, we made the decision uh, that uh, we would only test for stimulants related to the um, incentives. Um, so people were like, well, what about all the other issues that they have? Well. Good harm reduction is really important for people um, and good um, access to other services if they're using other substances or their lives are chaotic or they have other things they need to deal with. We wanna be able to provide them all of those things. But we also make no bones about the fact that this is an abstinence-based intervention for CM. So someone who's not really motivated to move in that direction, it's probably not the best intervention for them. Stuck to the 599 limit. We're still looking at ways that we can try to get around that, but right now it's 599. Um, if there were ways to do that, California has already considered moving higher, uh, but right now that's the protocol that we're going to implement. And one of the critical elements um, is how do we track the rollout of the incentives? You know, people talked about, uh, Wes talked about, um, you know, we don't pay very people very much, so those incentives are very enticing. My experience, what brought me to UCLA originally was actually to run a trial um, looking at contingency management for uh, gay and bisexual men about 22 years ago. And I rolled from that into my role as a director of training. I mean, my experience and in the other studies that we've run through UCLA, it's not really the person who's underpaid who's stealing the incentives. It's the guy, it's the client who comes in who's starving to death, doesn't have a house, and it's raining outside, and they just want a hamburger, right? And so a very well-meaning, heart-rended um, provider sneaks to the back of the box and gives them a hamburger. It's fraud, right? How do we prevent that from happening? Well, California has decided that they're gonna use an incentive manager. They have an RFA out now. There were some delays in that process. You may have heard that we were hoping to implement in June. Uh, we're now probably implementing right at the beginning of next year. Um, the applications have come in and they're being evaluated. But that incentive manager will be the vendor that provides the incentives for everyone participating in what we're calling the recovery incentives protocol. I'll talk a little bit more about that as well in a minute. So how do you do a pilot effectively? Well, according to California, you <laughs> once you have CMS approval, you say it can only be done in those sites that are participating in our version of Medicaid expansion. California also has a, a drug carve out in their Medicaid system. Uh, and so you have to be a participant in what they call the DMC, Drug Medi-Cal Organized Delivery System. And that is the expanded version of Medi-Cal. Um, there are 58 counties in California. There are 37 DMC ODS counties. Those 37 counties were able to apply for participation in the trial. No one was disallowed from their applications, but we did see problems in their applications related to implementation. So we received and actually worked with counties, um, 24 different counties, in order to participate in this particular trial. It's nice because we have the gamut of counties in California from rural to medium to large uh, or large populations. These are the 24 counties here, if you're familiar with California at all. Each of them are selecting a minimum three, sometimes four, five, or six staff uh, for at each of their 125 sites at current count, and they can continue to add those sites along the way. Congratulations, here you go, implement them all at once. That's the charge that we were given. 
So I have a small team that's directly focused only on CM. Myself and Beth as the directors, a couple of trainers, a couple of program directors, one focused on the front end, one focused on the back end. Um, so training uh, and readiness versus fidelity and ongoing coaching um, and uh, a couple of administrative coordinators. But I have a staff of 28 people that I move around, 25 people, that I move around across programs as needed and they'll be able to support this project as well. And they include all of those kinds of personnel. We're working closely with the Department of Healthcare Services, and I want to give a special shout out to Mike and Sarah um, and to Sarah Becker, because as I said, we're just doing what they told us to do, um, but trying to apply it in a way that makes sense for this protocol in California. Um, so let's talk just a little bit more about the CM coordinator, because again, I think it's the secret sauce. Um, and then we'll talk um, about how we're implementing those other elements um, of, of training and uh, support. So the CM coordinator, we've given this to each of the sites that are participating. You need to have excellent organizational skills, be able to handle the laboratory stuff. We have had sites say, no one on our site is touching P. We're like, great, we'll give you tubs, cups where you don't have to touch pee. That, that was one of the requirements in our review, that at least one of the cups that came out of our review, no one had to touch pee. Others, you may have to do dipsticks, things like that, but it gives providers choice. They have to have excellent communication skills. We have to remember, this is an all positive intervention, and it's really easy when someone tests negative to then give them an incentive and say, rah, rah. But what do you do when they test positive and your client says, fuck you, your test is wrong? How do you keep that a positive intervention? We need, we're gonna work with them to teach them how to do that, but we also need them to have some natural skills in that regard. Sorry for the F-bomb, it's late in the day. Um, <laughs> and of course, need to follow all the federal rules accordingly. So the CM coordinator, as I said, is basically going to implement the entire uh, CM intervention. Uh, they're going to ensure that the delivery is done accurately and that it's entered accurately into the incentive manager so that we have this great audit trail and can demonstrate that people are doing exactly what they're supposed to do. Um, we also are going to work with them and train them, but again, the sites are going to have to be responsible for helping them figure out what do you do if someone's acutely intoxicated, not just on stimulants, but what if they're drunk when they come into your office and how do you manage those kinds of issues? It's not uncommon in clinical settings, uh, but it may be new in this particular uh, protocol. Yeah, they're going to do everything. That's what I said. Um, so the CM coordinator is the root, but we know that all of the staff within an agency are really critical for this. We want them all to do the overview training because we want them to know about it and at least not badmouth it but be ready to support clients in participating in it if uh, they're involved in the agency. We also recognize that they may need other behavioral or health-related care in order to help them maintain their participation in the CM protocol, and we want the staff to be there in for that. Then the backup coordinator, the supervisor, and the county auditor will be involved because funds are involved. Training. We took the best advice that we could get. Uh, and actually the conversations that we've had um, have been very validating to what we're doing. When we talked to Mike and, and um, Sarah, they said their trainings were generally around four hours, sometimes a little longer, and they often complained of running out of time uh, to get everything done. Uh, Jim McKay said he did a day and a half training, which is about nine hours worth of training content when you take out breaks and lunch and things like that. We're doing about eight hours of training uh, in the California project. The first is um, an overview training. This is a recorded self-paced training uh, because again, we have to use resources carefully. Uh, we took a two hour PowerPoint, broke it down into eight small modules, narrated that PowerPoint, converted them into videos and require everyone to watch those on their own time and pass a quiz at the end. Everyone's welcome to participate in that, but anyone who wants to come on to the implementation training, what Mike calls the nuts and bolts training, must take that as a prerequisite for that training. So we don't have to explain those details all over again. And you see the elements that we put into that training. So the training is open to the public. So it's open to you as well. If you're interested in utilizing it, it does focus exclusively on voucher-based uh, contingencies, not prize-based contingencies, because we didn't want the California providers to be confused or think that they had options. Uh, but that's, I think, one of the biggest limitations of that particular training. But if you're interested, the site is there. That's a hot link, and it'll take you right to our, our site, and you can refer people to it. 
We do offer continuing education, including continuing medical education for anyone who wants to receive that. Um, the implementation training covers all the stuff that Wes said that we had to cover. Um, so the, the content um, is pretty straightforward in terms of what was required. But figuring out how we use that time to not just give information, but to give real world practice and really detailed practice um, has been the challenge that we've had with there's so much information to give. We can fill six hours with no problem. My staff have done that really well. That's where we are in the development of the training right now. So now we're breaking the training and pulling it apart so that we can figure out how to work more interactive components into those procedures. Um, so it'll be live, uh, all virtual, broken into two three-hour sessions. The first part being really about what is the protocol, and the second part being really about how do you how do you do it in in the clinics. Um, again, we'll offer CE credits, and the CM coordinator, the backup coordinator, and the supervisor are required to participate in that training, all of them, not one of them, in order to show that the site is ready to move on toward implementation. We're using a standard escalation reset and recovery starting at $10 with an escalation of $1.50 for every two. Um, here's the incentive schedule as it's laid out. First 12 weeks, twice a week, uh, with a maximum payout of uh, $26.50 per um, test by, if, by 12 weeks if you remain negative throughout. You see the second 12 weeks are pretty flat. You come in once a week, um, it escalates down, and then you get a little bonus at the end for two reasons. We wanted to get them there, and because that's what was left after we did everything else. <laughs> Um, because it's CMS funded, it is a billable service, so California has created billing codes um, that really are based on whether they had a positive or negative urine drug test, um, and they have billable rates in 15-minute increments that are designed to offset the cost associated with the, the staff time, but also the ancillary things that you need, urine drug tests, et cetera. Um, those, those rates are determined accordingly. Um, if counties say we need more than those standard rates that you've, um, that you've indicated, they can negotiate with the state directly for that. And finally, we're going to give each site a communication toolkit. That toolkit will have scripts and language that they can use to recruit clients, but also shape what's allowable and what's not allowable that they can say. Because it's a CMS funded um, program, we get we can step a little bit away from those tightest uh, implementation of the OIG rules, but we still wanna make sure that we don't step too far away from that to cause ambiguity within the program. That toolkit will be available on the DHCS, Department of Healthcare Services, CM website, which I'll give you the link to at the end of this presentation. All right, I have just a few more minutes and I wanna walk through the rest of what we're doing. We tell the sites that are participating, once you meet us, we're never going to leave you alone. Um, and it really is true. So after the training, the two required trainings, the next thing they're gonna do is they'll get a call from us just to see what's up, how, they, how we support, how, do you need any support? Do you have any questions? But they will then have to complete um, a readiness review. And the readiness review will be in two parts. First of all, it'll be a Qualtrics-based survey, kind of a self-assessment, where they have to walk us through their entire protocol. Not what does our protocol say, but what does it look like in the context of your agency? It'll require them to upload photos of their clinical space, describe how they're doing urine drug testing, all kinds of things like that, in order to demonstrate that they think they're ready in order to implement. When they hit submit on that form, it'll trigger us scheduling an interview with them in which we'll, be, we'll schedule a call with the team and we'll talk through anything that was concerning that came up in their self-assessment and do role plays with them on the phone. Uh, we're gonna actually ask them to, to deal with some challenging situations and see if they're ready to be able to do that. Frankly, with 400 plus um, people that are participating, we can't do what Sarah does uh, and record everyone multiple times and make sure that they're uh, responding with fidelity. But we do need to have some way of evaluating that at least at the beginning, they're ready to go with this. And then we'll follow up with them in a bit. I talked about the incentive manager, it's out. So I really can't tell you anything about what the incentives are going to be or how they're going to be managed because we don't know who the vendor is at this point and what their capabilities are. But we do anticipate that it will be some sort of 
electronic entry, and then immediate distribution of gift cards um, to vouchers to the individual uh, that can be spent with the limitations uh, as West, West indicated, as all of those were elements of the RFP that people had to respond to. Rick talked about urine gun testing earlier. We had them vetted by uh, Marilyn Houston, Houston, Eustace, thank you, I couldn't find it, um, who um, is a renowned toxicologist. She went through 20 some different urine drug tests and found four that met all the criteria for both cutoff levels um, for each of the, the stimulants that we're assessing for, um, as well as validity measures, creatinine, uh, pH, and um, temperature um, to make sure that it you know, came from human. Um, and, um, with self-contained point of care products. We do have a mechanism if people, if we missed a product and people think those should be included to uh, submit them. But unfortunately of the two or three that have been submitted so far, none have passed muster. Um, those are available. Um, there will be a document that will be posted within the next week or so that has the full list of, of uh, urine drug tests in there as they've been vetted by us. Can't release them yet until it's publicly available, but we do anticipate that going up any minute. Then we'll do ongoing support, um, and uh, it's really what um, uh, Mike and Sarah have already talked about, uh, which is ongoing calls. Um, the staff will be required to participate in at least one call monthly. Those calls will be open discussions to where people can bring problems to us, but we're also going to bring problems to them. We're going to talk through scenarios. We're going to do a little bit of retraining. We're going to identify issues that have come up and use those calls to um, support ongoing um, adherence with the protocol. And we're gonna do fidelity monitoring. So it'll be very similar to what we did with the readiness assessment. Frankly, we haven't built it yet, so I don't know, uh, but we're working on it. Um, it'll be based in part on Nancy, P Nancy Petrie's um, uh, fidelity scale that Sarah mentioned earlier, uh, but then again, adapted and applied specifically to California. It'll involve a self-assessment and an interview process in order to make sure that they're adhering to protocol. It's required that they do that at least twice in the first six months and once every six months after that. And a separate part of our group, um, directed by Dr. Darren Urata, um, got a separate contract from DHCS to do the evaluation. So we keep a pretty good firewall uh, between the evaluation and the training group, um, but they will be looking at um, sort of was it implemented according to fidelity? And, and as uh, Sarah said, you know, you always have to look downstream at, at patient outcomes and we want to know that we're getting some buy-in in this. But I always like to also put in the caveat that there's a lot of intervening variables between this intervention and that outcome. Um, and so we have to look at those, but look at them carefully as we go along. So next steps is really all about implementation. The sites taking the steps that they need to, the counties uh, engaging with the sites and then the sites uh, taking the steps that they need to in order to roll out these protocols accordingly and then begin participating in training. Because of the delays, we haven't been able to finish the training yet because the implementation manager has not yet been identified. So we can't put that into our training. Um, so we anticipate based on uh, the, the stated timelines that sometime in the next month or so, California will make an announcement about who the vendor is and move toward contracting with that vendor. At that point, we hope we'll be able to get enough information to finalize that. With realistic implementation, they're really hoping we'll train somebody and get them started in December. I think realistically, we're looking at starting training in January uh, and rolling out after that. Thank you very much. Um, I have more time than I thought I did, actually. Um, so um, we, Beth and I are happy to talk to you all about this. There's a lot of details um, with this project. And one of the things I want you to know about is the California DHCS website. There are a few tools on there that I think are invaluable to you if you're looking at these broader implementation issues. First of all, the text of their 1115 waiver is posted on there. So if you want to know what they did that won, that, that's a good piece of information to have. We've also, in all of the meetings, those stakeholder meetings, uh, individual meetings that we had with providers, we've developed an FAQ of all of those questions that we have to find answers to if we're going to implement them in spite of the lack of research. 
So if you want to know what those questions are, it's now 20 some pages, I think, of questions, um, including a big section on funding and financing, uh, which many people have specifically requested. Um, and there will be a number of other tools on there as well, including the communication plan. So I would encourage you to get these slides and use that link, uh, because I think there's lots of real world stuff that'll be very interesting. Um, in order to sort of make this work within the time constraints, Rick and I decided to sort of split our talk. So I just wanted to give you a description of what the heck are we doing? Uh, and now Rick's going to talk about some of the implementation issues specifically um, that we've um, identified. And when he's done during the question and answer period, we can both take uh, questions if it's related to the California protocol. So I'll turn it back to you. So we've already heard today two forces of nature. It was Dom, then it was Matt. I'm gonna add Tom to the third one. Uh, wow, that was that was a lot. Um, but it fits with you know the the size of the uh, cha charge you have to implement this in California. It's mind-boggling to me. And uh, well, well then uh, I'm gonna I'm here to introduce Rick Rawson, but. Uh, Rick and I have been doing this kind of thing together for a long time, and I, I was sitting there reflecting that we did a conference like this here in Vermont, I must have been 1999, we published an edited book in 2000, and Rick was one of the authors there, and I think of what's in that book versus what we heard today from Wesley, Sarah, Tom, and it is, the difference is mind-boggling. So while we may bemoan that this CM has been too slow and moving forward, the, the what has developed is night and day um, over these couple of decades. So um, I'm gonna introduce a big player in all this. Uh, Rick Rawson is a research professor at the Vermont Center on Behavior and Health at the University of Vermont and professor emeritus at UCLA. So the connection between between um, Rick and Tom. And, uh, but what I think some people may not know is Rick received his PhD in experimental psychology right here at the University of Vermont. And he's a native Vermonter, so he has that up on most of us. You know, I'm not a native Vermonter. So that means a lot in Vermont. Um, he's, he's, uh, he's done a lot throughout his career. He, heard, he shared with us uh, earlier, he, he did like six, 600 uh, lectures on CM over, I don't know what the time frame was the past year or so. So it's been a wonderful addition to the VCBH because that wasn't a strong suit of our center dissemination. So Rick is, he, he's really been a tremendous addition to the center. Um, he's represented the, the US at numerous international meetings on methamphetamine, lead addiction research and training projects for the United Nations, the World Health Organization, the US State Department, all exporting science-based knowledge um, throughout the world and uh, doing a lot of training. And uh, he's published uh, three books, 40 book chapters, more than 250 peer-reviewed articles, and uh, many workshops, paper presentations, and training sessions. So, Rick? Yeah, I still think of Steve as the new guy. Uh, <laughs> I was here from 196, well, here at UVM, 1966 to 1974. And uh, I remember parts of it. Uh, there, there, that, was, that was a different time. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank everybody for um, their presentations today. Uh, it is a... Uh, this is a remarkable session. I have a feeling this is going to be one of those sessions that you think back on in 10 years about when CM sort of took off because we've all been to the, well, Steve and his colleagues, and I guess I was part of it at CPDD, we set up that CM work group. And there was like six of us that would get together and uh, then there were eight of us, and then there were 12. But it was always like little picky issues around research protocols. 
this, like you said, this is really different stuff. Like how do you actually take this out and uh, disseminate it? Part of the reason I've been involved in this uh, for in the last five years or so, because my goal was to set up an animal rescue and uh, never see another person with addiction ever again, uh, was because, uh, well, first, when I got back to Vermont in 2015, Steve uh, asked me to help out, and I did an evaluation of the hub and spoke, the opioid treatment system in Vermont, and was really wowed by what Vermont had done. And uh, that was great. I got to go out to all these little clinics around the state and interview patients and uh, staff. And then I started getting these emails from uh, West Virginia, Kentucky, Louisiana, Indiana, Wisconsin, about meth. Now, I was the meth guy at, for uh, Alan. Where's that? Is Alan Budney gone? I guess he's gone. But Alan, I was talking to Alan yesterday, and he says he's the cannabis guy. Well, I was the meth guy for uh, my 30 years from, from probably about 1990, 85 to 2015. Most of what I did had to do with methamphetamine. My daughter used to go, couldn't you be the representative of some other drug? It's like, why does it have to be meth? It's like, I said, I don't know, I just, but anyway, I started getting these emails about, um, we're seeing increase in use of methamphetamine. What do we do about it? And I would go and do a talk and say, blah, 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 blah. And here's contingency management. And this has got all the data. And they would say, oh, okay, well, uh, how do we do that? And then I would say, well, there's this OIG thing that you need to know about that um, we're not sure how you can do this and not get into trouble with CMS. And they would say, well, what should we be doing? Anyway, that went on for a few years, for, for two or three years. And then Wesley um, let me know that the OIG was taking public comment on the idea of contingency management. And so we wrote, this was on New Year's Eve on 2019, I think, uh, he didn't give me much lead time on this, but it could, you had to get it in by that midnight. And so we had to write up stuff to get in about why CM should be considered for as a re reimbursed benefit. And starting then for till now, Wesley and I talk every week at three o'clock on Thursday afternoon to uh, with, a, with a group of other people. Tyler is now part of our, our group and he uh, uh, participates on how do we, we got all this interest on contingency management, we got all the science saying it works, how do we reduce the obstacles? And the, the first one was this uh, December 2020 final rule from the OIG, which Wesley interpreted and wrote a set of guidelines that SAMHSA has now adopted as the guardrails for how you can do this and stay in compliance with the OIG. That really broke everything open, was that, yes, we can do this, and you can do it, um, but you have to follow these protocols. Um, and now we're working on other issues. But, but let me, um, I'm not forwarding here. Just why are, why are we like all of a sudden excited about doing the stimulant stuff? This is one of Nora's slides. And the this is overdose deaths in the United States. I just want to point out that the blue line, the stimulants, primarily cocaine and methamphetamine. Part of the reason that, uh, I mean, as Tom said, California, we saw meth. We've seen meth since the 90s. And there was always this, yeah, we should do something about meth. We should fix but now there's this real anxiety when you talk to policymakers. And the reason is because of that blue line, it's actually impacting overdose deaths, which is if you think back on, on our response to the opioid crisis, what triggered the activity with buprenorphine was that people were dying and we needed to get treatments out to reduce the overdose death. That's actually driving the issue now. It's, it's there's no longer, this debate about with, with many folks about the, should we be doing this or should we not be doing it? It's like, how do we stop people from overdosing? 
And so that's gotten people's attention. And the answer is contingency management. This just shows that it's, it, this death rates have gone up uh, across all these different uh, groups. If you look at, this is the one year increase in overdose deaths uh, from uh, 2021 or 2020 to 2021. And if you look at the bottom line, the categories of drugs, there was a, about a 15% increase, one year increase in overdose deaths. Heroin was, were down. Um, cocaine, or synthetic opioids, that's fentanyl, were up 24.4%. Cocaine were up almost 20%. Methamphetamine-related overdose deaths were up 36%. Now, many of those deaths are a combination of, of stimulants and fentanyl. No question about it. It's not, it's not but there are actually quite a few, uh, when you look at the breakdown, there's a substantial number of methamphetamine-only deaths that were caused by the more uh, potent methamphetamine that's available now. Now, these are deaths, this is data from Vermont. Uh, this year, we just saw data out of the Haida uh, trafficking uh, for the first four months of the year. Um, there were 77 overdose deaths, 95% of them had fentanyl, but 61% had stimulants, either cocaine or methamphetamine. And I think that here in Vermont, there's not a perception of stimulants being involved with this overdose crisis. I think the mayor here in Burlington has a, a clear awareness of the fact that stimulants are something that need to be addressed uh, aggressively. And hopefully we can, we can work on that because I, I think it's being, uh, we haven't really addressed it much yet here. But I do, I want to, I don't want to give you a methamphetamine lecture, but I, one of the things that's important important to know is the drug we're dealing with, methamphetamine, is different than what we used to deal with. And, and this is clinically important because the patients are much sicker than they were before. Patients I saw in 20 in 2000 and 1990, they were addicted to methamphetamine, no question about it. And they had psychosis and they had, you know, severe addiction and other medical issues but it's real different now. They're much sicker, they're much more psychotic, and they're, to, to grab onto them and bring them into treatment requires a pretty robust intervention. And the interviews I've done with the patients and some of the qualitative stuff, they make it really, really clear. They would love a medicine, but there isn't a medicine. And they're not interested in counseling. They just don't want to hear it. They're, they're not interested in CBT or, you know, whatever. Um, so there needs to be something that's going to grab onto them. These are a tough uh, population to bring into treatment. As Mike mentioned, these are data from the state of Washington syringe exchange, uh, 400 people who were primarily users of opioids, 140 users of methamphetamine. When they were interviewed, they filled out these surveys 82% of those who said opioids were their primary drug said they recognized at some point they were going to need to reduce their use or stop their use or get into treatment or do something about it. Less than half of those who were using methamphetamine saw that. These folks just don't see themselves as having a problem. Well, if you don't see yourself as having a problem, you're not likely to want to enter treatment. So there's this front end issue of how do we grab them and pull them into treatment? And the second one is this was published a couple of years ago in addiction where they reviewed dropout rates of people from with different substance use disorders. These are the first 90 day dropouts. Those uh, with heroin, about 25% drop out in the first 90 days, tobacco, alcohol. According to these data, those three were all about 25%. Cocaine was almost 50% dropout and methamphetamine over 50%. So they're hard to get into treatment and they're hard to keep in treatment. So whatever it is you're gonna design as treatment, it needs to take those things into consideration. And when you talk to people about what it, what it is they would like from treatment, and you say one of the options is you might be able to get incentives for buy, to buy food or buy things, They'll go, yeah, that, that might work. That might be something I'd be interested in. And it, it seems awfully simple, but it, it, it really is an important part of uh, the component to get them in and to hold on to them in treatment. 
There are these meta-analyses that have all the data for contingency management, which you've already seen. The how much is enough? Um, obviously, seventy-five dollars isn't enough. The protocols that uh, Steve used and that I used and the others using voucher-based have ranged. They've been all over the place, but two to three hundred dollars a month seems like a pretty good place to start. Now, California is less than that because of this taxable thing that we're keeping it under six hundred dollars, so that we don't have to give a ten ninety-nine. Maybe, I don't know. Tom says that's up for discussion. I'm hoping we can get them to double that so that we'll have a, a, a intervention that's closer to 1200 bucks. Um, and of course, we use escalation and reset and recovery as Mike described. Tom talked about this coordinator position. Uh, the way that we're thinking about this in California will be that I think of it the same way I think of a, a dispensary nurse in an OTP where the if you're going into an OTP to get your methadone or buprenorphine you go and the nurse takes care of getting you the medication and giving you and then there's counselors and other people around doing things but this is the person that's going to be responsible for this um, when we when we started doing it in some of our discussions with Mike in Montana, it seemed like people were sharing the duty. It was like we were kind of generally training lots of different people and it became clear we got to do better at focusing down who's going to be the actual person responsible for this and then what's the auditing procedure going to be to make sure that they follow the, the guardrails and the guidelines. Uh, Wesley's uh, review of the OIG, the final rule, uh, he distilled, I don't, uh, Cece said people should read that. Uh, I disagree. Uh, uh, it's 200 and some pages long of um, information. Much of it has nothing to do with, with uh, the, uh, this issue, but somehow they found that it did. Um, and so Wesley distilled all of this down into a set of guardrails and what he presented today what SAMHSA has now in their SOR grant announcement are the guardrails he wrote up essentially the guardrails he wrote that SAMHSA adopted and um, they include this having you have to have a clear plan for preventing fraud waste and abuse and that it's clear it's written down and it's followed and it's taken seriously and uh, if we don't do that, we're going to screw it up. These are some of the challenges that that are we're still facing. Uh, the first you're all familiar with the, you know, should we be doing this? Should we be giving people uh, incentives? Um, the second one you're all familiar with right now, as of today, the seventy-five dollar problem. Um, that where does this money come from? As Mike mentioned, in the state of Washington, they took the $75, they added some alcohol tax money, and they got it up to $400 or so incentives. Um, the state of Wisconsin, who, which is on his list, he forgot to mention Wisconsin. You're, 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 in, you're in denial on that, aren't you? Yeah. But that's also going to be a statewide rollout for the state of Wisconsin. They've taken the $75 and they're adding some foundation money in some places and right so there the the money issue the money is is a big deal if if the $75 is lifted in the SOR grants as is being suggested we hope after the election that's going to open the doors for a lot of people to to use contingency management then you have to decide what are the uh, incentive levels you're going to use. Uh, you've heard what we're hoping to use, $1,000 to $1,200 for a six-month protocol in California. That will be sort of what we're, but we don't have any reason to think that's optimal. That's our best guess. Uh, and if there's the IRS issue. If we Even if we do get this approval to use higher amounts, if it's taxable income, the treatment programs are going to be responsible for giving out 1099 forms, which the patient will have to sign a consent form for them to give out. The, so there's, there's a whole bunch of hassle around that that we still haven't sorted out. Hopefully, the IRS will rule that this isn't taxable income. That would be nice. 
we, you've heard us talk about the fact that use of uh, negative stimulant UAs is going to be the target behavior. That went through a lot of discussion. As Tom mentioned, the uh, California uh, provider groups had a lot of thoughts about this. A lot of people interested in using attendance as the target behavior. Some uh, medication, HIV medication compliance, and some other things, all of which are completely legitimate uh, target behaviors, but again, to keep it simple and to keep it one model and to keep it most accountable, the UA result appeared to be the most uh, a direct way to do that. Who can distribute incentives? We're going to be pretty much um, rigid about this to, to uh, not any, any counselor who happens to be in the clinic that day can go and punch in the information and give out the incentive. Uh, that sounds very, I don't know, corporate or, or uh, but I, I think, again, following Wesley's advice that this is the first effort with this, we got to do it right, we got to show that we're taking these fraud prevention guidelines seriously, um, maybe at a later date, it can be more liberalized or uh, whatever, but we, we want to try to get it off the ground um, effectively. Uh, the, Tom mentioned the incentive manager, um, California, it'll all be done electronically somehow. Um, we're still working on, as, as he said, the, uh, who that's going to be. The, the one thing that I would discourage people if they were, if they're thinking about it is the, you know, go out and buy a bunch of Walmart gift cards and have a big box of them and put them on a shelf somewhere. Not a good idea. That's not going to be, uh, a useful way to do it. Uh, having an electronic system, and certainly the app-based systems are also have a, a, a useful way of tracking that stuff. Point of care tests, we've talked about that. That's This is new for many of the treatment uh, providers. Um, and there are a, a bunch of different ones, as Tom said, where the self-contained one where the person you know, urinates into the cup and nobody has to take a bottle and pour it in or do a dipstick or whatever, and all of that stuff. Uh, we have it in a way that I think is gonna be acceptable to the providers. The one issue that's really a, a challenging to us, I mean, our whole focus in California is on their stimulant use. That's the purpose of this recovery incentives thing. But in 2022, with fentanyl in everything, the idea of, not testing for fentanyl seems irresponsible. So we're going to also test for fentanyl. It won't have anything to do with the incentive, but it will certainly, if our, our coordinator says, yeah, you, you're negative for meth, but, but you, uh, this dipstick for the fentanyl dipstick, because we can't get, we don't have cups yet that have the fentanyl test built in. No um, right. Okay. It's, it's just, it seems like in the current environment to be treating people for substance use disorder and not looking for fentanyl is, um, is, is a problem. So, but we're, we're working on that. The evidence-based protocol we have uh, in, still in development, but virtually done. And the training and implementation plan, we got this from uh, talking to Mike and Sarah and um, this idea that, I mean, we're no longer, I, I won't let people just say training anymore. It's got to be training and implementation. Um, and I think that um, using, using what Sarah's got, what Sarah's done in her project and Mike's and uh, Sarah Parent's experience really was the foundation of the the California um, pro, uh, protocol, the training protocol that we're going to be using. Um, internal oversight and audit procedures so that there's a contingency management coordinator, a supervisor who on some basis, weekly, biweekly, monthly, audits the, the, the distribution of incentives and um, make sure that it's incentives are going out according to the protocol to the people for the, the reasons that we say they are. Now, there will, undoubtedly, there will be other services that will be delivered. Um, we're recommending CRA, we're recommending motivational interviewing as other 
you know, sort of wraparound behavioral treatments. But if people come in and they don't want to participate in the other behavioral treatments, it won't affect their participation in CM. That's one of the ones that we had this big discussion with the providers about, well, if they don't go to group, we're not going to let them stay in the CM. And we went, well, no, in fact, you will if you want to be part of this project. CM is the intervention. These other things are great. And if you want to get them into groups and motivational interview them till you're blue, that's great. But um, the, the thing they, they need to do is give the urine sample, participate in the CM to get the incentives. That's the, the, the core of what we're doing. I just wanted to point, uh, you probably saw information. Uh, Stacy's CORA project has produced, I think, a good overview. And there's a lot of these different overview products, but this is a good one that was produced here at the University of Vermont that I think uh, can be useful to people to get some kind of overview of the, of the uh, process. I'm going to stop there because I think it would be good to have time for people to do plenty of questions. And I've talked enough. Thank you very much. All right, so are there questions for our speakers? All right, Jim, you have a question? <laughs> um, well, I'm, I'm supposed to, as, as the, um, what am I? What's my role here? No, I'm supposed to have a question for you. So um, let me let me think of one. I, I've honestly just been blown away by everything I've heard this afternoon. So I'm not sure I really have a question. I, I guess I have a, a one comment. Um, when Rick, you said maybe we can uh, relax a little bit from having a designated coordinator. Um, I was going to encourage you, don't relax, stay yeah, corporate, right. stay corporate. I think it would be pretty important. But um, I was really just blown away how well um, you guys are thinking about California, how much work you've done. And I uh, um, think you, you really, you know, I'm, it's an enormous challenge, but you are really stepped up. Um, and again, I include Mike and, and Sarah and everyone else who's helping out in, in that effort. Um, I think maybe yes. One, Tom, maybe one, you guys have questions that we could discuss. One thing that I had no idea we were getting into is that every single answer leads to a thousand questions. Um, and the protocols from the research literature are pretty straightforward. You just do what it says in the protocol in the research literature. You have control over the staff because they're your research staff. You like tell them what to do, and it it all happens. But um, as we're looking at rolling out this um, this set of protocols across, or this single protocol across the state of California in all of these different settings, like the questions of, and what do I do in this case? Yeah. Or we use urines punitively in our program. So how are we supposed to do CM when we can't do it punitively, yeah. but over here we're going to use it punitively? It's a really interesting implementation yeah. Yeah. dilemma that we've never really thought through. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think any of the researchers that we've been able to find uh, have thought through it either. Mm -hmm. And so there's these rubber meets the road kind of issues that are the nuance of actual treatment yeah. that blows the protocol out of the water. Mm -hmm. And we still have to find solutions. Well, in part, the one I, I would throw out a, a partial, you said a, a number of things, but one that, that's been on my mind's come up a couple of times today is what do you do if somebody gets mad because they, they tested positive and, and they swear they didn't use. And one of the things we found helpful um, in a protocol that, that everybody tries to stay consistent with is it's about the test result. It's not about whether you used or not. Yep. And you know we if you insist you haven't used, we're not challenging that. We're just saying the test result says you did. And then we had some protocol, I can't remember it, maybe Sarah does. Um, you know, we had some, if there really looked like maybe the test screwed up, we would test, we would retest one time, but not more. 
Um, but you know, so so they there is some information available, and, and that sort of thing. And we built that into our protocol. Yeah. Actually, we're not advertising that people could retest because we don't no, want no, no, that definitely. to happen. But at clinician discretion, where it seems like something is really um, maybe amiss right. and or just to retain the client in care, allowing them to retest and say, this is going to be it. This is whatever result this is, this is it. Um, we, we've allowed in the space. Perfect. But, but we set, we capped it because at some point, you know, suppose the second one is, is negative, which one is right. <laughs> yeah. uh, so you got to cap it. Um, but one of the things we learned is never to, as the, pro, as the staff, never worry about it too much because it will show itself over time. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I think the other thing, Steve, just to add to that is we've created like a consent document, like a one pager. And I don't know if you all have one yet, or, yeah. but like just because it's such a different kind of intervention that people are used to, to where we just say explicitly it's the urine test that we go off. And, and it's a, we, we had the same, Mike, and, and it was a contract. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a contract in which that's that's laid out. The California draft will be on the website within the next few weeks. Yeah. One one of the things, and we I had lunch in the I think I just saw the lady leave, and she worked in Pennsylvania and was talking about her experience in, of training, doing some introductory training on CM with our current workforce who that works in the substance use service delivery, and it's hard to to express. You can say A, B, C, D, E, F. And when you ask the person what they heard, they heard oh. G, B, <laughs> T, L, Z. And it's like, you think, huh? That, and I mean, this is a huge paradigm shift uh, for uh, what's been done in our treatment system. Uh, now, and California has insisted that among the people considered for the CM coordinator will be uh, recovery coaches. Um, I, I asked Dr. Higgins, he, he said a master's degree. <laughs> and, and, uh, I can't I, say <laughs> master's degree. Someone who's capable of master's right, degree. Right. But we always had the pre-med type, I said. Right, right. The research yeah. assistants are really smart, young research yeah, assistants. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's not who we're going to get out there in, as our CM coordinators. So the um, we have to make sure the training and monitoring and Follow up, uh, and as Sarah pointed out, we're going to train a bunch in January, and by June, half of them will be gone, yeah. and you'll have another half. I mean, that's all going to be reality mm -hmm. of, what, of what what's in front of us in terms of getting this uh, off the ground, and that's that's going to be daunting. Yeah. And our plan is to train aggressively for the first four months and then start to slow down, but to never stop training. We'll have our trainers doing trainings all the time because we anticipate that there will be that kind of staff turnover. Also, the, the um, recovery workers, as Wes said, have to be supervised by an appropriate licensed professional. So the staff will be required as part of their readiness assessment to show that line of supervision to show that we're covered uh, under CMS regulations uh, for those to be billable services. And I was just going to add, like, so as a practical example, because I think this has been really fun because it's been iterative. So, you know, Rick and I, we started working together in Montana first. That sort of is informed what you're doing now. So in Montana, we started at $325 maximum incentives because Rick and I were just so enthusiastic that anybody wanted to do this. Um, <laughs> so we're just glad they had that amount. We're like, yay. So we did it, but now that you guys are on board with the 599 amount, now Montana is up theirs to 599. So mm -hmm. it's it's a really nice iterative process in that way. And I was just gonna say on the turnover side of things, we've worked with one, Kate's worked with one community. We've retrained them three times, just this one community in the last year, I guess it's been a year because they've had complete turnover two whole time. So mm -hmm. one potential benefit of the incentive manager is that um, the state is exploring right now because they'll actually be the payer, um, not the individual sites. The, so the state is exploring right now whether it would, wouldn't have to be the incentive manager as part of their contract that would do the 1099 forms, which would take all of that burden off of the local sites. If that's the case, they can work that requirement into their yeah. what they're paying the company for um, and offset that. So they're looking at the tax law, but they're also looking at workarounds for the additional administrative burden. Well, I have a question for you. Um, is the CM coordinator position going to be classified in a way that they could be paid more to try and decrease the likelihood of turnover? Yeah, we actually, when um, Kelly, the, the director of 
behavioral health or whatever. Um, we recommended a $50,000 range of a starting salary for mm -hmm. that person. I don't know if they're going to do that, but because um, of that point, the, yeah. the, this is this is like hiring a nurse for your That's exactly OTP. Right. You've got you you got to have this person, and they have to stay, and they have to be competent. How whether that will get carried forward, who knows? But mm -hmm. um, that's the right answer. The real answer is the counties um, dictate how uh, the contracts are done with the individual sites, and so the county actually has the final authority over what how they hire and what they pay um, in the individual sites based on how they contract with the individual sites. So I think we're going to see a lot of variability, but it would be interesting to see if those that come in with a higher salary, given comp comparable yeah. experience, aren't retained longer. And that mm -hmm. may be an interesting evaluation. Because, I mean, the, the, as Sarah talked about, that exhausted workforce that's out there, they're so underpaid. Oh, my oh, God. Yes. It's like they really are. Um, it, it's It's a embarrassing. I mean, to, we sometimes have them ask if they can be research coordinators. Yeah. Yeah. Their pace, yeah. I didn't mention this, but 70% of our providers are VA level. Yeah. 70%? Of the 198. Training, yeah. mm. That's pretty high. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's pretty high. So, meaning that only 30% have Oh, right. Yeah, for California, though, those BAs would be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, I think that in in much of the United States, a lot of the training I'm doing around the country, BAs are in short supply. I mean, it's yeah. it's uh, so. That, but retaining be in, in our experience in the research protocols, retaining the CM coordinators can just be a gift to the clinic because as they get it, gain experience, they they really make things happen. I mean, it's critical. Yeah. It is so now, helpful. there is the term uh, Sarah mentioned, champion, which is an implementation science special word. And where Tom and I have talked a lot about is the CM coordinator going to necessarily be the champion? I don't know. I don't know that it would have. I mean, they're going to be busy doing the nuts and bolts of CM. If you want to send somebody out to talk with the local college about yep. your treatment program yep. to promote that we're doing this stuff, that may not be the yep. right person, yep. but you have to have somebody, you have to have a champion. I mean, there's going to yep. need to be that yep. person. And, and, it, just, and, the, and those are almost two different skills. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We're anticipating that the CM supervisor will fill that role. Uh, and that's our hope. But again, it, it depends, as you were saying, what skills do they have? And are they the right person? But yeah. we'll, we'll emphasize the importance of that role. Yeah. That's yeah. pretty much We all. always thought about the person in that role as being, I mentioned pre-med, but kind of a wet lab type mentality, you know, note-taking, pretty good executive detailed, function, yeah. detailed. And, and we, you know, again, it's research protocol and grants, so we had money to pay, but but we always, because our other RAs wouldn't necessarily have those characteristics, but we would search for someone who did for, for that position. One of the things I think you, if you were listening, Cece mentioned something in her presentation about once we train some of these people to really be good at, we give them a certification or something like yeah, that. Yeah. And here, Steve and Tyler and, and I have been talking about doing so, having UVM or some other universities actually develop a certificate. Now, I'm not big on certifications. I'm I'm not I'm not a big like everybody should have more letters behind their name. But it it there may need to be something like that so mm -hmm. that these people could actually develop some greater ability to earn because they have this additional chip that they're they're, mm -hmm. they're doing. I think that would be worth considering. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just add to that, that when you're talking about making sure people were remaining trained, it just made me think of licensing and just being some annual evidence that you still have those kind of training. So it seems like you're going to eventually have to move into that area as well. Yeah. I think at the same time, though, I mean, a lot of my pitch, I don't know if this is the pitch the rest of you get on CM, is you don't have to be a licensed provider to do it. That's sort of part of why we pitch it. We have one of our star implementers in in Montana, I, she's so great on all of our coaching calls. She knows she's like, I was, I would love to hire her to be a yeah. research coordinator, postdoc, whatever. I was convinced she was a resident, a, a resident physician. 
Turns out she's an insurance saleswoman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah you know what I'm saying? Like a medical no, license? Yeah. Like a license. Yeah. Yeah. She, she, could have she, said, she could have gone to med school if she, she wanted to. So we talked about that, but she'd never even gone to college. Yeah. And so I think you're right about the certification and licensure sort of concept. And I think we also have been pitching this as an intervention that an unlicensed professional could implement too. Looks like we so, might have some uh, questions from- One more thought about audience. that though. What, the, like the fidelity monitoring that we're doing provides us an opportunity for ongoing continuing education as well. Um, and so while it's not moving toward licensure at this point, one of the things that we've recognized in our discussions in California is the critical nature of retraining on an ongoing basis. Uh, and that's one way that we're trying to do that. Charlie, uh, we have a, an online question, which is uh, simply: Could you utilize could you utilize certified health education specialists? Yeah, I, I think that um, the each of the sites will be responsible for identifying their staff, and there really are no specific requirements around it, except for the specific skills skill sets that you'd be looking for in the interview process. But right now, because of because of the the ability to have someone who's unlicensed do these activities under a licensed uh, provider that meets Medicaid billing requirements, it really can be anybody, as long as that then higher level supervisor is in place. Other questions, comments, Rhonda? So if you were doing this for tobacco, um, given it's a little different, in terms of treatment protocol and in, in the clinical systems, how, from what, you've, what you're doing in California and these other states, what are some elements that you would want it to look like? So say, right, we have, if we're able to get our state Medicaid office with us and ideally in a reimbursement capacity, um, I'm just interested in what you think we certainly like protocols and the parameters and um, the monitoring and that, but I'm just trying to figure out what it would look like for tobacco at the scale you're doing it for stimulant use disorder. I, I can just jump in with a simple answer, an app. I mean, I think that's where the app base, I mean, because one thing we've struggled with in Montana is just like Rick was saying, is getting people to come. Like, you know, they, they, we did the training, everybody was enthusiastic, the coaching calls, we got the right urine tests, we got the right gift cards, we got it all set up, and then nobody came, and then nobody came, and nobody came. And so we had to then pivot and start talking like we were about a research study. Like, you have to go out and hang up flyers, you know, without advertising inappropriately. You have to go out and start, you know, talking to other providers. And so, to me, when it comes to smoking cessation, thinking about where do people go who are looking for that kind of help, it's either going to be their primary care provider, health department, or online. So, to me, the apps just seem like, and then the, the demand is so much bigger. Um, it seems like that apps, the apps are the way to go there. There, there was a lot of discussion in California as we talked about this initial rollout about apps versus face-to-face. -face. Um, and because we're going to be under such scrutiny, frankly, um, in this initial rollout and because of the size of the rollout, the decision was ultimately made by DHCS to do face-to-face -face first. Um, get this rolling, get it implemented, prove the concept in this particular way with the sort of vision down the road that um, incorporating an app into it might be interesting. And I agree with Mike that that I think the future is probably in that direction, uh, but we want to make sure that we can solidify this as a fundable service uh, before we try innovative things that we don't necessarily have quite as much data around. Just a, a, a small detail, I guess. When we talk to the providers in California about having the availability of an, one of the apps that was described, the issue came up about, okay, well, no, hold it. We're, I'm, a prov I'm a treatment provider and this, the my Medicaid is gonna pay me X dollars for the sessions where I see this patient in person. Now I'm gonna give that money to the app company and I'm, so I'm not going to get any revenue from, from treating these patients. The app company is going to get the, the money because there's only so much money to go around. And I don't think we've thought all that through yet uh, as to how that's going to work. I mean, I, it, it, I'm sure it can be figured out, but it, 
again, getting to the California decision is our data on the efficacy of contingency management for stimulant use disorder is really based on face-to-face -face treatment. I mean, there are some few papers on, on extending it out to apps, but we really wanna make sure we give it our best shot with the, with the framework that we know works before we sort of get too creative with uh, other ways, because um, I don't know that it's gonna work with apps. We'll see. I hope so. Yeah. That's why I think just smoking is different in that sense. And, and Jesse's working on people's work is a little bit further down the line. And then I also think, yeah, I mean, the first thing, we already have a rural site that's talking to us and basically said in Washington, we don't do in-person care anymore. We're not going to go back to in-person care. It's too hard for us. We want a saliva test. And so now we have this whole negotiation. So I was interested in Jim's talk because we have this whole negotiation and like a whole change of scope of work to pilot that. So we already are thinking ahead, like, like Rick's saying, to this like 2.0 version at the same time, just trying to keep it as simple as possible to yeah. start with. And the one thing I, I would say, Rhonda, you asked a very good question, um, is the rigor we're talking about in, in terms of one person designated as a coordinator and the precision of managing those contingencies, the vouchers or prizes are only going out when they should and they're being withheld when, when they should be, um, is the same across the substances. And uh, uh, the other thing that crossed my mind, they aren't necessarily real distinct populations. Like yeah, the right. you know, <laughs> um, smoking, as we all know, is is now uh, residing in people who have a lot of comorbid conditions, economically disadvantaged. So, other questions for our panel. All right, I've then, got one. Oh yeah, please, Tyler. Sorry, I didn't see you. Oh no. So I mean, we've we've had this conversation now of two days with experts all across, understanding. You know, Wesley talking about the guardrails, and as Mike, you were talking about the scalability. We have the enthusiasm there. What are your thoughts on how we ensure the fidelity is kept, knowing that your time is limited, your time is limited, all these other states are interested. One of the things we'll have conversations on sometimes is. Someone's going to be there to fill the void. You know, we might not be there, and I might not be another researcher. So, how do we ensure that CM has its fidelity, not only at the level of implementation, but also as it's starting to expand? Because mainly, as really Wesley was talking about, the question is: you could have one bad apple that's not in this part of the community that says they're doing contingency management. We don't have a program that sort of oversees that. So, I guess it was somewhat of a comment, but more of what are your thoughts on how we should try to best proceed with that, knowing that this is going to be very much a walking on eggshells to some extent mm. um, to making sure it's a feasible thing to do long term? So good question. I'm, I'm first, I'll say this because I'm the only non Californian um, <laughs> up here. So, um, so, you know, when California created, well, California just passed, I mean, yeah, you're really from Vermont. I got, I know that. <laughs> um, Native Vermonter. Vermonter. <laughs> Um, you know, so when Cal California said that all their cars are going to be electric by 2035. And so some of us have been saying, California's going to figure this out. So the rest of us can do what California does. Um, and some of us roll our eyes at that, but also some of us say that. So me being the same person doing both. So I think there's, I think, you know, we need a, and this is why this is a great discussion. And, you know, we have a number of, of us talking to each other, but we need sort of some federal leadership yes. at a federal level to say, hey, this is, and we're starting to get it. And it's because of the hard work of, you know, a lot of you in this room. Um, you know, this is what it's going to look like and what it's not going to look like. And these are sort of those guardrails, those common sense guardrails. Um, and, and then I think, I feel, I just always use the buprenorphine analogy, which I probably talked to a bunch of you in the room about, and you all probably already thought of this yourselves. But, you know, when we started buprenorphine, it was such strict guardrails. People were scared of it, yes. well, the stigma about it. And so I feel like that's where we're in those first couple of years. And coming back to Wesley's point, we can't do it wrong. And I think that's going to require some sort of coordinated efforts um, to do that. I don't know exactly what oh, that looks great like. Great response. We're dealing with that right now in California, actually, because uh, this is a uh, DMC ODS specific intervention. You have to be a drug medical provider in order to participate in this program. So the program that sits right next door that has their own non-federal funding that wants to implement this program, what do we do with them? Uh, and frankly, we haven't answered that question yet. Can they do it? 
Well, it, it's a really good question. And it's something that we've just begun having discussions about along the way. So we've got to figure out fidelity in the CMS approved system, but then also how does that roll out to the non CMS uh, participating system? There's a lot to be talked about there. And I agree that federal leadership is what it's going to take. We should be collecting data on those non uh, CMS approved systems, if they're willing to take that chance. If they remember, a lot of these rules that we've been talking about apply to federal reimbursement. So if you're not doing federal reimbursement, you've got a different landscape. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that that different landscape is useless in terms of figuring out how to roll this out. So we do know that. Uh, you know, pair therapeutics, uh, QTI, dynamic care, et cetera. So there are all these uh, the, uh, private sector uh, activities going on with regard to CM. And so the real question is how do we get information from those systems mm -hmm. uh, so that we'll have a better sense of how to communicate with the uh, federally uh, financed systems. Uh, the motivational incentives policy group with people like Mady Chalk, Sarah Wadenberg, Carol McDade, uh, Rick Ross, and myself, John Roll, we're trying to get that information. We want this landscape to be as diverse as possible, but to have the kind of integrity that the OIG uh, mm -hmm. is, will respect. And as I mentioned, ECRA, the, um, the new the emergency uh, Recovery Kickback uh, Act will apply to the private sector. So there are chances for the private sector to run, run into difficulties. So the more information that we can get uh, about how this is being rolled out in real time, in real life, the better off we are. Excellent point. Rhonda, hey, Rhonda is the final question. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, do you see at some point, given the reference to dual and poly use, being able to couple um, so that states could be more effective in, you know, like using the evidence around if you're treating tobacco and alcohol, you're reducing, right, the likelihood of, um, you know, relapse. And so just wanted to gain your thoughts on you what you see for that in the future. I think that um, the goal is to, to do it in its purest form with the, high, the uh, issue that has the highest evidence to start with. Um, and then of course, adaptation and expansion will occur. Um, and once we prove the concept, then it's easier to find the, the spaces in between where we can begin to roll in some of those more creative ideas. I think the incorporation of, of other apps um, into the space, I think it's really interesting. And I think it's, like I said, the wave of the future. Um, I think looking at other substances and, and where do we move where do we stick strictly to drug testing? Um, and where do we move away from that in terms of what we're incentivizing? Um, I think there's experience in those arenas and I think there's room to move in those arenas. Let's do it right, small, directed first, get OIG off our backs and say, you know, so that they're not quite as concerned about it. And then we can look at some of those other adaptations. And to add to that, I literally turned in an R01 on, on Tuesday where I wrote, it's on alcohol use disorder contingency management. And I wrote that this work in stimulant use disorder is going to set the platform for expanding to alcohol use disorder. So disqualified you all as reviewers now. Um, but that's that's my hope. It's because I'm an alcohol use disorder researcher. And I think about the size of our alcohol problem relative to methamphetamine and 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 that, you know, this would be a powerful intervention for alcohol or for smoking and and have a bigger public health impact. But I agree doing it as a proof of concept here in a big way then we'll set the stage for us to expand. Yeah. And, and all the evidence is on pretty focused interventions with contingency management, not too many, like whatever drug you happen right. to be using, you have to be negative for, for all of them. But in my experience, just watching uh, CM grow within the research world, um, there was a tendency to want to start rolling in multiple drugs. You know, okay, you did just cocaine, but I'm going to do cocaine, benzodiazepines. And this is a, a behavioral economic intervention and um, if, you, if you start to do that, you better up the magnitude of your incentive. So you start asking for more and more, you may get it, but you would have to pay, have a larger incentive. Yeah, so, Steve, yeah. We, yeah, we just finished a trial where we had uh, folks who had to be abstinent from two drugs. 
and I call it the FU condition because we had such a high level of attrition. It was so high because we weren't people. Yeah, and I think one of the one of the things we haven't really studied at all. I mean, CM has been developed as an intervention. We've done out efficacy trials and all of those, but we haven't looked at it as how do you make it a broad scale public health intervention that really helps to drive down the overdose death rate. That means you can't see 40 patients and, and expect that that's gonna drive down the overdose death rate. I mean, you're gonna have to see a big proportion of the people with stimulant use disorder. And if you, the more you would add to that, okay, it's gonna be stimulants and tobacco and it's opioids and light alcohol in, you're gonna get fewer and fewer people saying, I want that because these many of these folks say, I have this problem, but these other things aren't a problem. And if you make me say, I'm going to like also not use any of those to get the incentive, I don't want to have anything to do with this. And then you're, you're reducing your population health uh, spread. Uh, just a final thought. Beth and I are really excited about our, the opportunity to be the lead of the implementation and training in California. Um, it is no small amount of very ominous responsibility because uh, we know we screw it up. We screwed it up. If it works, everyone gets the credit for it. So please don't hesitate to give us your thoughts and ask your questions. Use that email address that's on those slides uh, and let us know what you're thinking because every time someone asks a, a question, we end up having to, we end up solving a problem we didn't know we had. Um, so we really appreciate your participation in that as well and want to hear from you. Thank you. All right, please join me. For Rick. <laughs> No, yeah, they don't need steps. Uh, they're spry young young guys. Um, all right, so uh, I will be brief. Uh, so I've said several times already that um, I'm just blown away by how well this this has gone. Um, the the science, the discussion, everything is, is just been excellent. Um, so I, I really want to offer my sincere thanks to all the presenters, the um, in-person and remote audiences, um, to our uh, training program folks, our, our uh, pre-doctoral and post-doctoral trainees. Those are the folks been running up, changing the slides. And, um, and so, um, and then to our, our staff, um, both from the Hilton and from uh, VCBH um, sitting in the back. Uh, everybody's, yeah, really been terrific. Um, so as we've done uh, with each of these uh, conferences in this conference series, we're, we're planning to follow up with a special issue of preventive medicine. Um, and uh, so please try to participate. I will be in, in touch with the oral presenters um, and um, I hope you will participate. Of course, I know how busy everybody is. So if you can, I would understand, but it's important to get this information into the archival literature. Um, we'll reach many more people that way. Um, so in terms of what our, our aims were for this year's co conference, is um, we wanted to do, we wanted to put a spotlight on the outstanding science um, of CM, the empirical evidence that supports CM, and then to discuss progress in the considerable challenges with CM implementation. And I think we've achieved that aim. It's not over, but I, we've addressed um, those topics in a really substantive way in the, in the past two days. So uh, I couldn't be more pleased about that. Um, the, um, I, you know, this morning I, I took some time to think about this and I shared already, you know, we've done these every couple of years, every so many years. So we did one in, in 2000. Well, we, it was probably in 1999 with the edited book in 2000. Then again in 2007 with an edited book in, in 2008. 
Then in 2011 and 12, U.S. Navy was interested in adopting CM, and we had one of these meetings in a special issue of preventive medicine. And then again, um, these last couple of days, and I already said it once, but I'm saying the growth from 2000 to now is night and day. It's just just across every every aspect of it. So that that is really um, a pleasure to witness, and I think um, you know just a sign of of uh, where we're going from here. I think um, you know one question is. Um, uh, Wesley mentioned something like, is it going to keep growing or is it going to shrivel and die? And I think that's a really <laughs> a good way of putting it. Um, I think I am, uh, but I'm prefacing, I am a, an optimist. I'm not sure exactly why, but I think it's somewhere in your temperament. I'm not sure where, but um, I, I, this is going forward. I'm pretty confident of that. Um, the evidence is just too strong and the need is too great for this not to go forward. Um, I don't know what the pace will be. And, um, you know, when I look at what the pace has been, I think it could have been, it could have been faster. Um, and, you know, us who have lived in the weeds <laughs> could all point to things that we think are, were um, obstacles or um, hurdles that shouldn't have been there. But, um, and I think there would be some truth to all of it. So when I reflect on just wrapping this up, I guess the last thought, and it, and it comes back to what I was saying about advocacy the other day, um, you know, this is important stuff we deal with. The, the people die when we don't get it right. Um, the overdose rates, the um, people who are who who maybe could have quit uh, smoking, but we didn't give them adequate treatment. Um, the, we all have responsibility. I, I admitted already in this conference. I reflect: Have I done enough in the direction of dissemination? And I think I could have done more. Um, so I think across the research community, the policymaker community, including the NIH Institute policymakers and Institute staff, um, the clinicians, I think we all could do more. And um, I hope with that, that we will do more because um, I, I also said to the, uh, at this conference, you know, I would guess you all agree, the current treatment system is not adequate. <laughs> we need to do a lot better. And then the, the problem, I, I, this one I can't remember, but someone was, oh, I think it was Mark Levine earlier. I mean, it's enormous. You know, the, the problem is just, you know, well, the, the overdose rates are so great that they're, they've turned over the downward, the US uh, longevity statistics for the first time. Well, I think it's the last couple of years, but that was the first time in the history we've been um, collecting that data that it's gone downward. Um, so, so it's a very serious uh, responsibility we all have. Everything I saw in this conference is this group is pretty pretty ready to to meet those responsibilities and has been doing it, or else we wouldn't have that growth. I was I was um, mentioning that that I witnessed. So, so uh, I'm just very optimistic that this is going forward. The people you've heard from. Um, over the last couple of days will be key contributors, but there's going to be, it's going to take many more as whoever showed, I came from, I forget the slide story, whoever showed the slide, was it you, Michael, who had the slide with push brooms in it? Well, that's a great, great slide. Uh, so that's what it's going to take. Um, I, I appreciate everybody's attention and energy over the last couple of days and uh, safe travels uh, for those who have to travel far to uh, go home. To the uh, remote audience, thanks for your attention and participation and um, look forward to seeing you at the next CM conference eight or 10 years from now. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much.